Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around at Science Fiction Saturday again, I've got two science fiction movies from Charles Band's Full Moon Entertainment Company, both starring the same wonderful star, Tim Thomason, and they're a lot of fun. They're from the VHS era in the 1980s and early 1990s. And I re-watched them yesterday and got such a warm, nostalgic glow, I decided I'd have to share it with you. But before we do that, a little bit of housekeeping. First off, if you hear noise in the background, it's incredibly windy here. It's so windy, in fact, that the ghost of half prison will appear in my backyard. When they call the wind, Mariah. Second thing is, the channel has just reached an epic milestone of 2 million views. It'd be nice if YouTube gave me a dollar for every one of those views, but they haven't. It's an amazing milestone nonetheless, and it's all down to the viewers. It's not me, it's the viewers, because you are the guys who watched every one of those 2 million views, with probably a few exceptions where I, I went through the video myself later on. But it's still mind-blowing. It's still like... Bleh. And thank you very much for all the support the channel has gotten. Thank you to the Patreon supporters and the channel members, and the people who just watch the videos and occasionally comment on them. It means a lot to me. It's a strange thing to be kind of peaking and doing my best work at such an advanced stage. And I don't think I'll ever not be grateful for that. I think it's a great opportunity to be able to do YouTube and to get an audience and a community going is even greater. So again, thank you very much. So let's get on with the movies. 1984 was a great year in science fiction movies. There were a lot of good things that came out in the genre that we all love. Some were better than others, but I've just got a short list here just to give you an idea of the zeitgeist of the year. Electric Dreams came out, Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock, The Terminator, whatever happened to that guy, The Brother from Another Planet, which is John Sale's really interesting science fiction film, Chud, which I should do for the channel. Let me know if you want me to do Chud, Buckaroo Bonsai, Dreamscape, the Last Starfighter, Repo Man, and on the Lucasfilm side of things, the Ewok Adventure Caravan of Courage, probably one of their best. But yeah, it was a great time for small, mid-budget science fiction films because the VHS era created an immense hunger for product. Distribution companies were looking for things to put out on tape, and drive-ins and cinemas were looking for interesting things to show that wouldn't cost them too much because they were at the time fighting the threat of video rental. And so we got this kind of convergence of two technologies fighting against each other, and the audience only benefited from it. Charles Band's Full Moon Entertainment took advantage of that and put out a lot of movies in the 80s and 1990s, which we now look upon fondly because we all rented them on weekly VHS, 10 for $10, I think it was at the time here. And so we grew to love them. They had really interesting and splashy cover art, which sometimes much better than the movie but nonetheless that was a, a peak era in some ways for mid range in budget science fiction films and i have a great fondness for it around that time i was living in st kilda and having a great time i was seeing bands i was having fun with friends doing a lot of cool stuff and i would watch these things voraciously when i didn't feel like going out or i didn't have the money to go out and we all know that problem. I'd go down to the video store, use sometimes my last $10 to get 10 for $10, paid cash in those days too, and grab a whole bunch of science fiction and horror films off the shelf and just watch them. And Trances was one of those. In Australia, Trances was known as Future Cop for no good reason. And it's a 1984 American science fiction film directed by Charles Band, who, to be fair, was not the best film director in the world. But he knew good products, and he got good writers a lot of the time. And in this case, he got Danny Bilson and Paul DeMio, who were the guys who, six years later, would create the Flash TV series with John and Wesley Shipp, which I've got a lot of fondness for. And I should re-watch that, because I've got it up on the shelf there the whole season. I think I'm up for that. I think I'm up for kind of 90s retro, slightly cyberpunk science fiction uh, superhero stuff. But I'm digressing. I like Daddy Bilson and Paul DeMeo's work. They did Zone Troopers, and I've talked about that on the channel before. World War II science fiction aliens crashing in the European war front during World War II. A lot of fun, done on a low budget. And when it started, one of my favourite 1980s action film stars, Tim Thomason. And he stars in Trances as Jack Death, a trooper from 300 years in the future 
who is sent back into the body of one of his ancestors in the 1980s to stop a man who has the ability to turn weak-willed people into zombies. That guy's name is Whistler, he's played by Michael Stefani, and his ancestor into whose body he goes when he goes back in time is a police captain, which makes it really difficult. Now, Jack Death has the usual hard-boiled detective backstory. His wife and children were killed by Whistler and his trances in the 23rd century, and he's quit being a trooper, he's quit being a cop, and is going freelance to kill any remaining trances in his century. And the movie sets this up with a futuristic cyberpunky diner, where Jack Death walks into the diner, and the diner's beautifully retro. There's a weird 1980s retro futurism to it, where there are 1960s poker machines and a jukebox and a bar, and a lady in a uniform behind the counter, and rough guy sitting at the counter, and Jack Death goes in there to find and kill a trancer, where it turns out the gruff guy in the corner is not the trancer, but the waitress is. He has a good fight with her, and then he gets called in by the authorities to find and bring back Whistler from the 20th century. What Whistler is doing is there's a legislative council in the western part of the United States, and he's going back and killing the ancestors of the leaders of the Western Council, and so they no longer exist in the 23rd century, and we get a bit of backstory where they've been very instrumental in reconstruction after natural disasters, one of which flooded Los Angeles, which is kind of cool because it, it taps into the 21st century zeitgeist of global heating and sea level rises and we can kind of get on board with that really well and one of Jack Death's hobbies is to scuba dive through the ruins of Los Angeles and find artifacts. So he gets sent back into the 20th century body of one of his ancestors, a journalist called Phil, whose girlfriend Lena is played by a young Helen Hunt. This is Helen Hunt at the stage where she was transitioning from a child actor to an adult actress. She basically helps Jack Death track down Whistler, track down the ancestors of the council members and save them. Now there's so much of this movie screams 1980s and it's a lot of fun for that. It's got a kind of low-key synthy score about it. Lena takes Jack Death to a punk nightclub which is kind of fun and very retro. Lots of neon and spiked hair in there. And Tim Thomason's Jack Death is a fun character. He's a hardball detective up in the future. He's got a scar down there, which is kind of cool. But in the 20th century, he doesn't. He slicks back Phil's hair with um, hair gel because dry hair is for squids. Get finds an old trench coat and finally convinces Lena that he is who he says he is and for her to help him track down the trances one of whom runs a tanning salon. Remember tanning salons before skin cancer became popular? Uh, he kills a mall Santa, which is kind of nice because the Santa gets turned into a transfer as well. And shopping malls themselves are becoming slightly retro. we still got a lot of them here in Australia. But I know in the United States particularly, they're on the outer and they're becoming abandoned and derelict places. And we get a few of the people who turn up regularly in Full Moon Entertainment movies. People like Art Lafleur playing McNulty, one of the cops from the future who comes back into the body of an ancestor who turns out to be a little girl, which is kind of fun. And we also get some, uh, we also get some interesting character actors like Anne Seymour, who was in films from the 1950s, and Richard Hurd, who appeared in a number of other things, and Telma Hopkins. Uh, yeah, it's got a, a really great vibe about it. One of the things that Full Moon did really well was they used abandoned places. So a lot of the places where Jack Death is looking for trances and looking to protect the ancestors of the council members are abandoned places around Los Angeles, warehouses, factories, former power plants, that kind of thing. They're great because you can light them easily really well to give them a certain feel. They've got pre-installed graffiti in them and you don't have to worry that you're going to mess the place up and have to pay for having it fixed. And that's my use of locations as a hallmark of 1980s science fiction cinema. And I love it. Robocop has a lot of it too, where the, the bad guys are all in enormous disused factories and things like that. Trancers actually had a 4K release late last year as well, which is kind of cool. And I may or may not be picking up a copy of that, just depending on how the finances go. It had five sequels. Most of them were shot direct for video and never got a cinematic release. And even in the last one, you don't even get Tim Thomas in it. 
it's uh it's an interesting franchise uh, some people will say oh we should resurrect that franchise the same way they say we should do a new version of the hidden that other great 1980s science fiction alien invasion kind of film but i don't think so i think you've got to let certain movies sit in the time in which they were made and yes Charles Band did milk the cash cow until it turned into beef jerky by making five sequels to Trances. Only the second one is really worth your time. If you're going to go down that rabbit hole, just watch the first one and the second one, which still has Helen Hunt in it and has some interesting complications. And the baseball player, played by Biff Maynard, gets a bit of a extension to his backstory as well, which fills out the world of Trances kind of nicely. That one I enjoyed. I think it uh, it's a sharp 76 minutes, so it doesn't outstay its welcome. It's shot really well, and it's interesting because you've got a kind of dark, bleak future, and you've got a retro 1980s past. So you, as a 21st century viewer, are kind of in between those two things. And that makes it a slightly different viewing experience than it was when we slipped a tape into the machine and just pressed play and went through all the ads and enjoyed the movie. I'm, I've got to correct myself a little bit though. It is released now by 4 Minute Entertainment, but it was Empire Pictures, the previous Charles Band company, which produced it in 1984. I'm fairly sure a lot of the Full Moon Entertainment movies are on Tubi, so if you're looking for a copy of Trances, you may well find it there, and if you don't, you'll find a whole bunch of other Charles Band movies of the time on Tubi, so that's your first go-to if you want to look at these movies. Her rewatching was a great nostalgic experience, and I know nostalgia is a trap. I know you shouldn't get too far down the nostalgic rabbit hole because you'll end up just watching the same old movies and not watching any new ones. But this one was a fond memory renewed for me. Now, the second one's also a Tim Thomason joint from 1991, and the character here has a lot of similarities with Jack Death. And this one's from 1991, directed by Albert Pune, stars Tim Thomason as a space cop called Brick Bardo. And the movie is Doll Man. Now, this one wasn't written by DeMio and Bilson, which is a bit of a shame because I think they could have lifted the game a little bit. But it's got some really interesting things about it. Thomason plays Brick Bardo, who is a space trooper from the planet Arturos, which is 10,000 light years from Earth. And there are some unusual criminals on Arturos. Bardo hunts from down. He has a gun which is incredibly makes Dirty Harry's 357 Magnum look like an airsoft rifle. It blows people apart. So he's tracking down a criminal called Sprug, who's his arch nemesis. And Bardo has encountered Sprug a number of times and blown bits of him away each time they encounter each other. Until Sprug is basically a head sitting on a drone. Sprug is played by a guy called Frank Collison, who has a very memorable face. I've seen him in a number of things in small roles. So Sprug gets to his spaceship and travels away from Arturos through a space warp. And Brick Bardo follows him to Earth, and they land in the Bronx in 1991. And there is this montage that Albert Pion uses to fill out the runtime of the movie of street scenes in a very rundown Bronx area in 1991 and that montage is cut and scored really well it works well as an independent thing and that's where this movie has an interesting divergence yes it is the story of a space cop trekking down a space criminal who is a head on a drone but it's also a gritty crime drama set in rundown areas in New York in the 1990s. So it's both fish and fowl. So Bardo lands on Earth and finds out that everyone on Earth is six or seven times taller than him. He's a doll and they're giants and his gun is about as powerful as a 22 air rifle. He encounters a criminal called Braxton played by Jackie Earl Haley, the wonderful Jackie Earl Haley, who was Rorschach in the Watchmen movie and has been in any number of other films. Really fine character actor. Got his start in Day of the Locust playing that little androgynous kid who Homer Simpson, played by Donald Sutherland, stomps to death at the end of the movie. Spoilers. So he's running the local gangs and taking out other gangs. We see him take out another gang with a bit of a drive-by. He's a loose cannon who manages to make an alliance with Sprug 
because Sprague has weapons that he needs, including a bomb which Sprague says will blow things to bits, and Braxton wants that bomb. Meanwhile, Britt Bardo and his spaceship are taken back to the home of a woman called Debbie, a single mother, played by Kamala Lopez, whose son is fascinated with the fact that his mum's brought home a spaceship with a little alien guy in it. And so you've got this set up where Braxton wants so giving Debbie a lot of shit because she's chasing all of these drug dealers off the street corners by basically hassling and going full Karen on them. And so he wants rid of her, he wants rid of Bardo, and he wants the technology that the aliens have. Now, there are a few really interesting aspects of this one. I don't think it's anywhere near as good as Trance's but it's got, uh, it's got some kind of vibe about it. First off, there's that criminal vibe, and Jackie Earl Haley, really fine character actor, brings his A game to Braxton. His Braxton character is creepy as hell and scary as hell, and Jackie Earl Haley commits to the role. He's really good playing the bad guy in this. And the way he gets rid of Sprug is really fun too. He gets wounded by Bardo's gun, and Sprug partly heals the wound that he's got and then it reopens and he spends most of the end of the film bleeding and and kind of realizing that he needs to get some help pretty quickly for the gut wound that he's got but he, he does commit to this the a games there he, he does a fantastic job of it and the other aspect the other locations yes they've got those kind of abandoned place locations but they're in the context of a kind of decaying urban landscape and Albert Pyun does a fantastic job of incorporating the two, you know, the, the kind of space cop thing, and the very grounded and kind of realistic streets of the Bronx, which are part of the movie as well. And even though the end of the film is basically on a building site where there's been demolition of some kind of large industrial estate, it still has that vibe about it, and it still lifts the level of the film it's not just set in some kind of generic cityscape. It's grounded in a specific place at a specific time with a specific problem, which is gang violence and gangs taking over parts of various cities. And it kind of works. I think that that extra effort shows on the screen. And Thomason is still doing his tough guy thing and doing it quite well. But he's a tough guy who's tiny in human terms. And even though the comedy of that isn't particularly played up, it is there. Uh, there was a sequel to this called Doll Man vs. the Demonic Toys, which is a sequel to both Doll Man and one of Charles Band's movies, Demonic Toys. I haven't watched that one yet, but I've got a copy of it and I'm inclined to watch it because I'm, on, I'm riding that nostalgia train for the next couple of days at least. But just to finalise on these movies... Tim Thomason was good at what he did. He started out as a stand-up comic. He did comedic things like playing Gene Gene in the Quark TV series with Richard Benjamin. Now, there's always a sly bit of comedy underlying his tough guy persona in both of these movies, where his tongue's slightly in his cheek, but not too much. He doesn't overplay the comedy as much as allowing the comedy to happen around the character. The first one, Helen Hunt's really good. She, she lifts the movie quite well and gives an interesting foil to Jack Des. Hey, this is a different century. This is really weird. People are eating beef in Chinese food and all of that kind of stuff. He's got someone to play off there. And in Doll Man, Brick Bardo and Debbie have an interesting relationship as well because she wants to get rid of these gang people and he just wants to get home. And, and so there's an interesting and different dynamic there. The interesting thing is there are people discovering for the first time the Full Moon Entertainment slash Empire Pictures movies and enjoying them. Younger people who never saw them on VHS are starting to get on board with them because of their weirdness and the fact that they're not mainstream movies in the sense that they weren't made by big Hollywood studios with really big Hollywood stars, but they've got a quirky individuality to them and a street-level vibe that the big studios were never successful in emulating. And that, of course, is part of their attraction for me. I was living in one of the more colourful parts of Melbourne at the time I was watching these films. And I would, that the vibe of both the Los Angeles of Trances and the Bronx of Dolmed were not incompatible with the life I was living and where I was living. And that 
made them very attractive to me at the time and now make them entertaining and nostalgic for me in the 21st century so that's it for this time around thanks again for the two million views that again blows my bloody mind and i will never not be grateful for the support the channels receive from you the audience and particularly the wonderful people on patreon and in channel memberships who support my addiction to watching these movies like subscribe leave a comment hit the notification bell support the channel through channel membership and there'll be a link in the description of the video on how to do that or you can do it by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash terry talks movies next up i've got the final of my hidden gem a to z movies which i'm doing w x y and z and i've got a ton of films for those that's just going to be such a ball and then i've got to figure out what kind of hidden gems i'm going to do in subsequent weeks i want to keep that ball rolling because it really keeps me refreshed as far as my movie view is concerned and it makes me appreciate a the fact that in this century in this blessed century it is possible for people to own movies having grown up at a time when that wasn't possible in any real way it's something that i occasionally think about 12 year old me would have loved being in this room with this many movies and part of me is still 12 year old me and part of me is me now working out where i'm going to put the next 100 films i get but that's part of the struggle and it's part of the joy of being a film buff so until next time watch some good movies watch some bad movies watch some tim thomas movies i think he was very underrated and i'll catch you next time